I mean, rumen pH is, is a classic marker, but we can also look at those acute phase proteins in blood that might be indicative of systemic inflammatory response. Um, we can also look at, you can also do manure scoring and, and um, you can even do body temperature. And if something was severe enough, you could have a change in body temperature. Um, but the other things would be rumen metabolism and, and trying to get an idea of volatile fatty acids or ruminal LPS, which is um, part of the bacterial cell wall. And if that goes up, that means there's probably bacteria dying and lysing in that environment and releasing this LPS. So that's another sign of these low pH environments. Uh, hi, I'm Bill Weiss, host of the Dairy Black Belt podcast. My guest today is Kirby Kronstadt, um, who's a new assistant professor at The Ohio State University, and that's my former employer for about 40 years. Um, he started just a few months ago. He's housed up at the Worcester campus. He has a, a research and extension appointment, and he'll be focusing on the, the inter interaction or intersection of, of nutrition and health, and also nutrition and sustainability. Uh, Kirby, welcome to the Black Belt. Yeah, thanks for having me, Bill. Uh, you wrote a review or a mini review in JDS Communications uh, recently, and it's it's a it's on the effects of acidosis and systemic uh, inflammation, and both of these are a, a, a big issue in dairy today. So that's what I'd like to talk about. And, and briefly, this is a two part uh, podcast, but briefly, would you discuss um, this acidosis model, this uh, acidosis model, challenge model that you use a lot in this review. Yeah. So, I mean, this was definitely my favorite paper to write during my PhD. It was um, kind of a brainchild of mine and I was glad to push it through. And the acidosis challenge that people, the model people normally use is feeding a relatively uh, standard lactation diet, a higher forage diet. And then they'll suddenly switch the treatment or switch the diet to these cows and they'll increase uh, fermentable grains like barley or wheat in place of some of that forage. So a diet might go from 55% forage to 45% forage and go from 25 percent starch up to 32 or 33 with fermentable grains being the balance being the change so it's a very dramatic diet change without any adaptation or um, any step up to that diet it's an abrupt uh, quick shift and then there was a paper out of Canada it's been over 10 years now uh, 10 years ago where they abruptly added pelleted alfalfa mm -hmm. and they found a lot of the same things with of, of the grain model, but they also found some really different things. But you, you discuss that, those results a little bit. Yeah, I, I really enjoy that paper. So they had two distinct pH or two distinct acidosis models. They had their grain challenge model, which was just what I illustrated. It was an abrupt increase in grain. And then they had an alfalfa pellet challenge model where they took a dry alfalfa hay, pelleted it, and fed that to these cows in, in place of like a fermentable grain. But they did a step up with that over six weeks where they went from zero to 15 to 30 to 40 to, I think, ended up with like 50% of the diet as these pelleted alfalfa hay pellets. And what they found was they saw a similar reduction in rumen pH for both of those groups. Both of them had what we would call a subclinical acidosis. Both of them had a very dramatic increase in ruminal LPS, which is another kind of diagnostic marker in, in, in uh, subacute acidosis. But the difference between those groups was the grain challenge group had a spike in an acute phase protein called haptoglobin that we use as a, it's a systemic marker of inflammation. So the group that had the green challenge had that spike. The group of the alfalfa challenge actually didn't have any sign of a systemic inflammatory spike, even though they had the same rumen environment changes. So it's kind of one of the first bits of evidence that there's a little more complexity to, um, to gut health than just gut pH. That's not the entire story. And I think we often gloss over that. What, what could be some other, you know, room and pH is easy to measure. And that's why mm -hmm. we, we measured it for 50 years. But what else can we measure then? Or what might be a better indicator of, of these things? 
Yeah, I mean, and I'm speaking in a research setting for this type of deal. I mean, rumen pH is is a classic marker, but we can also look at those acute phase proteins in blood that might be indicative of systemic inflammatory response. Um, we can also look at, you can also do manure scoring and and um, you can even do body temperature. And if something was severe enough, you could have a change in body temperature. Um, but the other things would be rumen metabolism and, and trying to get an idea of volatile fatty acids or ruminal LPS, which is... Um, part of the bacterial cell wall. And if that goes up, that means there's probably bacteria dying and lysing in that environment and releasing this LPS. So that's another sign of these low pH environments. On a lot of the rumen measurements aren't too practical in field or on farm, mm -hmm. but blood is something that can be sampled. Do you think there's value in measuring these acute phase proteins on farm as a, as a diagnostic? Yeah, I think we're getting there. I don't, I don't know if we're all the way there yet. So there's actually um, a collaborative research project that Dr. Bradford's been working on where they're trying to benchmark farms to a systemic um, systemic inflammatory markers to get an idea of, you know, what's reasonable, what's not, what are some factors leading to those, to those things. And maybe diet is one of those factors. We really don't know. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's in its infancy. We hope that it can get to the point where it's a really good diagnostic marker for animal health and animal success, but I'm not sure we're quite there yet. So when I think of acidosis and animal health, I always uh, stick to some of the fundamentals, which is, you know, watch your milk fats and watch your manure scores. And, and if those are within reason, um, you probably are not dealing with any major acidosis issues on a dairy. And uh, recently or more recent than rumen acidosis is large intestine mm -hmm. uh, acidosis. What, how does that differ and, and then rumen acidosis or, or does it? Yeah, I think the, you know, fair, when we use that language, fairly same type of definition, right, is a drop in that luminal pH for that organ. And the research is kind of interesting. We've tried to decide is, is the inflammation observed during ruminal acidosis from the rumen or is it from the hindgut? The rumen's got four layers of protection. The hindgut has one. Is that where, is the hindgut more susceptible? And so hindgut acidosis has gotten a lot of attention but actually, the literature so far is not very compelling to say that it's an inflammatory insult. Okay. Um, so they are the same in that there's a drop in pH in both of those chambers. Um, but the anatomy is different in both of those chambers. And we don't know how they behave really under an acidosis environment. Ivonic Animal Nutrition is committed to ensure food security and safety while reducing the ecological footprint of animal farming. Its products and services use evidence-based solutions that seek to promote animal welfare and reduce reliance on natural resources. All this is underpinned by long-standing industry partnerships and deep customer understanding. Ivonics focus on efficiency, sustainable, healthy nutrition, and collaborations with livestock farming partners creates value for customers and consumers. And then um, a lot of this is still starch, so let's let's mm -hmm. finish up here with some recommendations on how we can reduce the risk of, of acidosis or reduce the the effects of acidosis, less systemic inflammation. So what would be some recommendations you'd have? Yeah, I, th I think there's a couple of really easy ones. I would say um, I, I like to stick to dry ground starch sources. When you when you do a wet and siled starch, like a high moisture corn, it increases the fermentability pretty dramatically. And the data from my view, tell a story that those fermentable sources are the problem. It's not starch per se, it's how fermentable is it in the rumen. And so I think that that is one of the challenges. So I would, have, I would stick to dry ground sources of grain. Um, and I would also tend to stick with like corn versus barley or wheat. You know, barley or wheat are very fermentable. And if you're feeding fermentable sources like barley or wheat, your, your maximum starch should probably be something like 27, 28, compared to with corn, you can probably go to 30 or 31 um, and still be maintaining a, a relatively healthy gut and high milk fats. So um, those are my two big ones is avoid wet and siled grains and, and stick to corn compared to wheat or barley as those are pretty highly fermentable. And if, if you, you know, certain parts of the country, barley is going to be king more or less. Yep. And other, other areas, high moisture corn is, is you know, going to be used a lot. So you, you just recommend if you're going to use those starch sources, reduce the, the total starch in the diet. Yeah. Yeah. I think it definitely, it puts a ceiling on, on how much you can load the rumen. Um, it just, uh, it, I think, I think 
you just drop that ceiling a couple points and and you'll be good. Okay. And what and just to finish up and let's say like buffers, mm-hmm. forge particle size, these types of things, how would they come into play? Yeah, I think um, the way I think about it is it's like buying insurance. You know, uh, buffers will give you a little bit of insurance. It gives you a little more leeway on the amount of starch you might be able to push in a diet while maintaining room and pH. Forage particle size, much the same way. If we have, um, if if it's not causing, if it's not so long particle size that it's also causing sorting, then you're still probably giving yourself a little insurance um, and buffering that rumen. But the thing I want to cav or caution is it's. It's not that these might necessarily improve gut health, because I don't think we know, I don't think we have a great definition of what that is, but it will at least moderate rumen pH, and it should um, protect your milk fats in the tank. But whether it's actually protecting the health of that barrier, of the ruminal barrier, the hindgut barrier, we don't really know. And I guess my last question is, is this going to be a research area you, co- you continue to work on in your, you start your career? Yeah, I think this is really where I'm going to be pushing the next couple of years. And we're working on trying to really define what a healthy gut barrier looks like, um, especially with looking at the immune function of that barrier and getting an idea of what immune cells might be present in that barrier. And also finally stretching into longer term feeding studies. So instead of all the projects I talked about that fed starch or fed higher starch diets for a week or 10 days, we need to start thinking about feeding these cows high starch diets for three, four, five, six months to see what that does to that barrier over time. Great. I I look forward to to reading some of this work. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks a lot for joining us today. You bet. Thanks for having me.